Hey guys, welcome to a new video. This one I promise I'll try and keep it as short as possible because what we're here to talk about is what we think is our ideal power setup. And I'll step you through how over a period of a couple of years, we feel like we've finally reached a point where we can be basically indefinitely off grid. Uh, and other than water, we don't really need to think about much more. And I'll explain how we use the power because that's also going to be one of the most critical things that you need to think about. So, first of all, when you are thinking about building your ideal power setup, you need to have a good indication of, of, of what are you going to use. And what do I mean by that? Well, who is using it? In our case, it's Danielle and I, or she doesn't like me calling her Mavo anymore, so I'll call her Danielle or D. Um, what D and I actually are doing, I work for an international consultancy firm, so I need really good internet, which means that I need to use Starlink, which means that I need a lot of power reserve to be able to do the work that I do. Mavo, Danielle does all of the, her stuff in terms of social media, all of her photography work, building YouTube videos and that sort of thing like this. So we need really, really great connectivity and really great connectivity comes at the price of needing to have a really good power system and a backup or redundancy. We're not traveling with kids. So it's only the two of us. And yes, we've got lots of devices that need a lot of power, but when you've got kids, you need to also consider how many devices are they charging? Are we gonna be running TVs? Do we need potentially to be using aircon off grid and all of those sorts of things as well? So have a look at your own power bill and use the thought process. Well, I feel like my power bill's a bit too high. You're probably gonna need a big system. If you feel like you've got that under control, it's only the two of you, you aren't doing the video rich and data rich stuff that we're doing, you're probably gonna think that our system's overkill as well. So that one's gonna be up to you guys. You just need to have a think about who's using it and how you're using power when you're camping off grid. The next thing that is really, really important guys is thinking through, do I throw all my eggs in one basket or do I build things out over a period of time? What do I mean by that? Well, we've got investment in lithium power, inverters and charging systems, plus our solar in our van. And we've also split our investments between the car as well. Because generally we know when you're touring long term and you wanna be off grid a lot, you're probably gonna have a car in the fridge. Uh, sorry, you're probably gonna have a fridge in the car. And so you're gonna need a battery system probably rather than just running it off your main crank battery. It's nothing worse than not having your car start. So you're gonna need a power system in there. So with that in mind, particularly if at the point where you're just starting out, it's a good opportunity to have a think about this stuff before you make a purchasing decision. Now, this particular van, I'll step you through the specs of what we've got, and then I'll do a bit of a walk around. I'll then step you through the car, and then I'll go through to all the other equipment that we carry with us to make this all work. So as you guys know, we do a lot of travel with the Jawa vans and we do a lot of testing out. So let me step you through the specifications of this particular van, knowing that the specifications in the bigger vans are slightly bigger in terms of overall uh, battery power and that sort of thing. So we're in the Lowdown 13 Escape at the moment. This actually comes out of the box standard with 300 amp hours of Enerdrive lithium. So that's the first equation you need to think about when you're building a power system. Then what are you going to use all of that or how are you going to use all of that battery power? So this one has a 2000 watt inverter, an 80 amp combo charger that's built into the inverter. And it's also got a DC-DC charger, which is 40 amps rated. And it also has an MPPT. Now the MPPT takes the power from the solar panels on the roof. And in this particular van, we've got 600 watts of solar panels on the roof feeds it into the batteries. Now with that DC-DC, that will charge from the car when we're traveling and everything's connected up. But we've also got a panel, oh, sorry, a plug on the back of the van, which I'll show you in a second, that allows for a, a soft solar panel to be connected to. And hence, 
our 600 watts of solar on the roof with the 300 watt soft panel that I travel with actually becomes 900 watts of solar. Now that generally, because it's fed one through a DC-DC and the rest through the MPPT, means that we've got two individual feeds coming into this battery at any given time, whether it's through the car charging as we drive along and the solar on the roof, or the soft panel and the solar on the roof. That means that we're getting a lot of power into this battery because we use a lot of power, so we need it to be up to date. I'll show you all of this in a second, but um, effectively over the last nearly two weeks that we've been off grid, the van has been up to, to up to 100% every single day, even with me working, with Danielle working, and using an awful lot of power. So let me show you those components, then we'll move on over onto the car. Let's go, maybe. So quickly, let me show you a few of the bits of hardware that we've got going on in this particular model that we're working in. So here's our controls for our Enerdrive inverter. You can see that the battery is looking really healthy here, sitting at 13.3 uh, volts. Really, really quickly on the E-Pro here, even though we're drawing about 20 amps of power, utilizing our computers, utilizing the Starlink, which is plugged in, and that three th uh, two, sorry, 2000 watt inverter, we're still getting 10 amps into our battery. Given that we started today at around 75% because we used a Starlink a little bit last night, we're at the middle of the day, it's not even lunchtime yet, and we're sitting at 90% with a huge amount of power draw and 10 amps going into that battery. So let, you sh let me show you the componentry now that is, is actually making all of this work really well. All right, so here we are in the central nervous system of the low down 13. Thankfully at the guise of Jar, I've made this one easy. It's not under the bed, it's actually in a cupboard. If you have a quick look here though, as I was saying, I've been working today and I've got a little bit more work to do. So you'll see my external monitor, you'll see my computer all ready to go there for my very next session. So let's quickly have a look in under here, Mavo. So, first thing is our MPPT charger. So you'll see that there, that is taking the feed from the rooftop. We've then got our DC-DC here, which is running more power from the rooftop. It's just cycling through. And so as I was saying, we've got those dual feeds of power, which is not only sustaining the fan I've got running, the multiple monitors I'm using, the computer, Mavo's computer out the side here, and all of the other, th the lights and everything that we've got going in this van, but it's also putting power back into the battery. By the end of the day today, we're gonna to be up to 100% and ready to go, even though we're heavily using power. So let's now go and check out the car and we will have a look at what we've done with that. All right, so here we are at Barry. Now, as I said, we've split our investment between the van and the car. And one of the main reasons around that is because of how dependent we are when we travel on the internet, particularly when I've got a lot of work on, is that I need a fallback. If something goes wrong with the van or something goes wrong with the car, we've actually still got power available to us. So let's go and have a look at what we've done with this car. First of all, maybe I'll just get you to look here. We've got a 200 amp hour. E Pro, uh, sorry, B Tech Lithium and a drive battery, and that is actually powered by our Ener Drive Adventure Pack. So, exactly the same DC DC charger that we saw in the van is in my car. That means that the alternator is actually going to continue to charge um, when I'm driving. But I've also got a 170 amp, and I'll put some photos of that in a second, panel, glass panel mounted to my Rhino rack on the car. That was the final piece to the puzzle because we didn't have that panel up there before. And I'll show you another thing that we do in terms of charging the battery in the car as well. But until we got that panel up there, which is constantly connected, so whenever the sun is up, and looking at that panel that is feeding the battery, that is enough mainly to one, keep our 60 litre or 65 litre angle going and keep that battery at 100%. So much so, I've seen it giving nine amps of power in. It is enough to control our Starlink 
and also keep the fridge going without our battery going down when that's working optimally. Now you'll see an AC charger over there. To be really honest guys, I got that because the guys at Enerdrive and Jar are really good to us. So I probably wouldn't invest in an AC charger unless you weren't using the solar like we do. You probably don't need it. The other thing that we've got built into our adventure is another 2000 watt inverter so that if everything is completely wrong with the van, which we haven't had a situation where, but just say it did happen and I still needed to work, I've got that 2000 watt inverter. Now, what this also means is when we're away from the van, so if we went really deep off grid somewhere where we couldn't get the van, or if we just decided to go down to the beach for the day to have a good time and that sort of thing, we've got 200 amp hours of battery, 2000 watt inverter we can actually use an induction cooktop we can throw the awning out like what we've done today connect the battery into the into the adventure pack all of our lights and that sort of thing will work so effectively we've got enough power even if we didn't have the solar setup for probably about 48 hours off grid keeping the fridge running keeping our lights on keeping all of our devices running and even running our starlink so that is really cool and i I was really reluctant to do the roof mounted solar panel because I didn't think I needed it. But now that I've done it, it absolutely just completes everything for us. There's one more thing I want to show before we finish with the car. The last thing I wanted to show you on the car, if you come this way, Mavo, is you'll see a couple of Anderson plugs sitting here on the bottom. Now this one here, this top one, will actually take an input from that 300 watt solar panel, that external panel, soft panel, portable panel that I use, I can also connect into here. So not only am I gonna have 170 watts on the roof in that glass panel, but we're also gonna have 300 watts, albeit that soft panels aren't as efficient as glass panels, coming in here all running to the DC-DC. So I can get up to 40 amps from that 470 watts of solar panels into that 200 amp hour battery as well. So when you're ordering, or sorry, when you're setting up your vehicle and connecting all of this, and maybe you're using an auto spark here if you don't feel confident doing yourself, make sure you wire an input Anderson to your drawbar, particularly if you aren't using a roof mounted solar panel. So I've got the ability with 200 watts to have up to 400, sorry, 200 amps in the battery, have 470 watts of power. Now, usually it's not super efficient, but I'm probably gonna be getting two, 300 watts in good solar conditions back into that battery, which is gonna fill that up, keep our, our fridge running, keep our Starlink running, even when we're away from the van. Now let's go and check out just a final few things that I think are, make really good sense to invest in when it comes to solar and this overall setup as well. So let's go over back to the van maybe. All right, the final part, like I've got on the car, I've got that Anderson plug that's running to the DC-DC to allow us to plug that portable panel in. We've got exactly the same on the back of the van. Now this comes standard with a Jawa, but if you're retrofitting lithium and a whole heap of 12 volt gear into your van, have a think about this one as well. It is literally just a um, 12 volt uh, wiring that runs to that drawbar with an Anderson plug, and it will go into your DC-DC, which then connects to this soft panel. So let's walk over to the soft panel maybe. It's actually not set up optimally, so I'll fix this up. The sun obviously moves. So what I love, it, I'm actually just gonna drop it down because the sun's really high. What I love about the soft panel, guys, if it plays a game, is you can set it up to chase the sun. You can follow the sun from basically when it comes up all day long to get the optimal charge out of this particular unit. The other thing that you need to do that I've really just done, and as I said, this takes time over multiple years basically to get right, is make sure you've got a really long but really good quality Anderson lead or 12 volt lead as well. I've always had the five meter ones. I've now gone to a 10 meter one. I just found those five meter leads just weren't long enough. Some of the time they were, but other times they weren't. So make sure you invest in those. So just a quick rundown of what we do from a power perspective, guys. Just a couple of last minute tips. Now, rooftop solar will only, even in the best conditions in the middle of summer, be getting optimal power for 
a maximum of three to four hours a day. And that is because they're fixed on a roof. So there's going to be different angles as the sun moves throughout the day. And the other thing you need to think about is what's getting in the way between the sun and between your panels. So things like trees, things like maybe if we look over here at Barry, where I've got that roof mounted panel, there is stuff hanging all over my roof. I've got a Starlink dish on the other side. Actually, come and show everyone, maybe. Because of our Starlink uh, angle today, I've actually got this up mounted on the car to get up, up above those trees. First thing this morning when the sun was coming from the east, that was actually obscuring my panel. The shadow of the Starlink was it going over my panel, which meant that it was only putting in maximum of one amp. As soon as the sun got over that shadow and there was full sun on the panel, it went up to nine amps. So shadows and that sort of thing can significantly impact the quality of your solar. Hence again, why I choose to carry that soft panel that I swap between the van and the car, wherever that's needed, because I can chase the sun and make sure there's no obstructions and I'm getting an optimal feed. So there you have it guys, lots to think about. One, how am I gonna use it? Two, what equipment have I got? Three, how do I split my investments between maybe the car and the van, depending on how reliant you are on this sort of thing. And then for just some of those bits and pieces that you're gonna need above and beyond the standard setup to help you optimize what you're doing. And five, be aware of shadows, be aware of clouds and that sort of thing. Now, we are now at a point where I'm 100% confident that even when we get three or four days of rain and overcast weather, that between the van and the car, we can continue to do what we do because we've got enough redundancy and enough different things to make this all work for us. As I said, some of you may be watching this and think, what a peasant, that is not enough for what we do. And that's cool. Others may be watching it going, wow, that dude's got way too much stuff. It's all coming down to you working out what you need, but this works for us. We're not always at the van, but we've always got power. And when the car and the van are together, we've got a choice point to make. Oh, the other thing you need to carry is a 10, uh, 10 meter uh, AC lead because you might want to use the inverter to power your Starlink over there. Or you may have a 12 volt conversion on your Starlink. Anyway, there are so many options, but I hope this video helped you out. Last thing, guys, if you liked it, one, give it a like. Two, if I haven't covered anything or you've got some thoughts or suggestions, please whack them in the comments because we love getting back and hearing from you guys. We really hope this one has helped. Look forward to seeing you out there on the road. See you in the next one.